Welcome to today's webinar, where we will be exploring the researcher in residence model in health and social care. This is the latest in the series created by the Health Foundation to explore the science of improvement. My name is Bill Lucas and I'll be your facilitator today. My own research is in the application of learning to the real world, so this webinar is of special interest to me. And I'm guessing that if you're watching this, you are similarly curious and will want actively to participate by sending your questions and comments to us as we talk. We all certainly very much hope so. With me are three practical experts who are also expert practitioners in their fields. Martin Marshall, Christina Pargel, and Ruth George. Beth George, I'm sorry, Beth. Martin is Professor of Healthcare Improvement at UCL, where he leads Improvement Science London. Christina Pargel is also at UCL, where she is a lecturer. And Beth is Deputy Director of Integrated Care at Tower Hamlets Clinical Commissioning Group, where she leads the Integrated Care Programme across the boroughs of Newham, Tower Hamlets and Waltham Forest. The format of today's session will be that Martin will describe the emerging models of researchers in residence. He'll give us some history, some research and some background, along with an anatomy of the emerging models as he sees it. At the end of his presentation, Martin will pose some questions. Christina and Beth will then respond to these questions from the perspective of a researcher and a manager, adding their own experiences uh, of embedded researchers in healthcare. At this point, we'll do our best to respond to your questions and comments. So Martin, welcome. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much indeed, Bill. So Christina, Beth and I are going to be presenting this model, which attempts to occupy the middle space, if you like, between academia on one side and health service uh, organisation and delivery on the other. It's a developing model. It's at a fairly early stage of development. And I'd like to acknowledge a number of people around the country who are making a very significant contribution to the work that we're going to be talking about uh, today. First of all, to two of my uh, colleagues at UCL, Martin Utley from the Clinical Operation Research Unit and Naomi Fulop uh, from the Department for Applied Health Research, uh, both of whom are leading uh, embedded research programs. And Martin in particular, who in many ways planted the seed for this work four or five years ago when he came to the Health Foundation to talk through a project that Christina is going to be describing to you um, and to um, seek help with the evaluation of it. Um, secondly, I'd like to uh, thank um, three people who are funded by NIHR on knowledge uh, mobilisation fellowships. That's Leslie Wye from Bristol, Sue Mann from London and Vicky Ward from Leeds. Um, all three of them are doing some really stunning work in uh, uh, getting research into practice, in occupying this middle ground. And they bear both the uh, pleasures and sometimes the bruises of, uh, of fulfilling this function. And then finally, I'd like to thank uh, two of my local colleagues within UCL Partners, uh, Laura Rare and uh, Debbie De Silva, both of whom are, are fulfilling researcher in residence models. The model that um, I'm going to describe to you is essentially trying to solve two very practical problems, and both of them, I think, will be familiar to the audience. The first one is we know that there's a lot of useful health service research out there, or maybe potentially useful health service research out there, but it often doesn't have sufficient impact on clinical practice. And the second problem that the model attempts to address is that there's a lot of research questions that practitioners, managers or clinicians might be asking that researchers simply don't have an answer to at the moment. And if I could uh, express that in a slightly popularist way, researchers sometimes don't scratch where decision makers are itching. This model forms very clearly within the spectrum of uh, improvement science activity. And I notice that uh, previous webinars, people have described improvement science in sometimes slightly different ways. I find it helpful to see it as a, a spectrum of activity. At one end of uh, the spectrum, uh, we have a set of methods owned mostly by practitioners, things like PDSA cycles, Lean, Six Sigma, business process reengineering. At the other end of the spectrum, we have a set of activities owned mostly by uh, academics, a whole range of different methodologies that are used. What the researcher in residence model uh, occupies is this space in between, this hybrid space, a space that uses participative methods, embedded scholarship, 
and a range of different action research methods. So what are the key features of the in-residence model? The first one is that the in-residence researcher is a core member of the operational team. Very often researchers regard their role as being objective, as being detached. They uh, work and live in different institutions, in different organisations from where practice is happening. Sometimes that's described perhaps um, critically as, as living in ivory towers. That isn't possible for a research in residence. A research in residence gets into the real world where things are happening and proves useful to them. The second feature of the model is that they bring a specific body of expertise to this team. And it's a body of expertise that is different from but complementary to the expertise that, that other members of the team might have. That expertise includes an understanding of the research evidence base, the empirical and theoretical evidence base, and an acknowledgement that it needs to be interpreted for local use. An understanding of the broader impact of improvement, the policy issues, for example, the larger picture of where an improvement programme fits in, and the un unintended consequences of improvement. They bring an understanding of theories of change, an understanding of how to evaluate both formally and informally, and an understanding of how to use data. I don't think researchers in residence have a monopoly on any of these features, but they are well trained in them, and this is the body of expertise that they bring. The third feature, and perhaps the most important feature, is that um, the research in residence doesn't just tell or impose um, the expertise that they have. Their job is to recognise that scientific evidence, a scientific way of knowing, the scientific method is just one way of knowing. And their job is to negotiate that way of knowing alongside other ways of knowing. So probably the best way of describing this model is it's a meeting of experts. I'd like to just work through some of the um, underlying principles, if you like, um, uh, for the model and just work through these one by one. The first one is that the model attempts to address problems that have been well recognised for a long period of time. Over 100 years ago, a commentator in the Journal of the American Medical Association said, the scientific man has been too scientific and the practical man too practical, and the result has been unfortunate for both. An interesting description a long time ago. Larry Green, one of the leading researchers in the field of embedded research, done a lot of work in the field of education, described how evidence-based practice needs practice-based evidence, building very much on Kurt Lewin's work of there needs to be an interaction between both action and research. And then finally, and perhaps most poetically, uh, Donald Schoen described in his wonderful book, The Reflective Practitioner, the challenges of operating in this ground between what he described as the hard high ground and the swampy lowlands. He said, we're confronted with a choice. Shall we remain on the high ground where we can solve relatively unimportant problems according to our standards of rigour? Or shall we descend to the swamp of important problems where we cannot be rigorous in any way we know how to describe? A really interesting description. The other problem that the model attempts to address is this problem of operating at the boundary. Modern society often encourages us to operate in silos. That's where we develop our bodies of expertise. But there's growing interest and growing acknowledgement, I think, that it's the interface between these silos where change really happens. So Tillich, the German philosopher, said the boundary is the best place for acquiring knowledge. And Yo-Yo Ma, the um, international cellist, who's clearly a very um, deep thinking person, described work from the um, uh, field of ecology, where he said the edge effect in ecology occurs at the border of two ecosystems, for example, savanna and forest, meet. At that interface where there's least density and greatest diversity of light form, life forms, each living thing can draw from the core of two ecosystems. That is where new life forms emerge. Perhaps it's a little grand to describe the research and residence model as a new life form, but you can understand how there's a, a vacuum, if you like, between the two sectors of academia and service and how there's space for the development of new approaches. The second uh, principle underlying the, underlying the model is that it's based on uh, models of work which are well developed in other sectors. If we look at uh, the research in residence model or the in residence model in general, it's an interesting critique of where experts are and where they go. So generally, if you're an expert in something, you talk to other people who also have expertise in that area. And that expertise kind of spirals out of control. It spirals away from the people who potentially have the uh, opportunity to make uh, great use of it. So the in-residence model is about the democratisation of that uh, expertise. 
An interesting example, um, many examples around, a poet in residence in Barnsley Football Club. I'm sure there's some Barnsbury Football Club uh, supporters uh, listening to this uh, webinar. In the British Library, they have an innovator in residence. And the researcher in residence model was introduced, to my knowledge, first of all, by the Department for Education, when over a period of nearly 20 years, they funded the model of bringing university academics out of their university institutions and putting them into schools to talk to um, school children about their areas of interest. So there's a, numbers of mod a number of range of models of where this uh, model has been used in other sectors. The third principle that I want to talk about is that it draws upon two distinct bodies of literature, uh, probably more than two, but two in particular that I'm aware of, the knowledge mobilisation literature and the participative or participatory uh, research uh, literature. First of all, looking at uh, knowledge mobilisation, a lot of uh, stunning work in this field has been done by the Canadian Health Service Research Foundation over the years. And they described how the challenges of getting uh, evidence into practice can be framed in two different ways and how you frame it then determines, determines what you do about it. So the first way of framing this problem of getting research into practice is one of knowledge transfer. So the problem here is on one side we have uh, experts in, uh, in uh, the generation and use of knowledge. This is the academic experts who are bringing, brimming, over, brimming over with expertise. At the other side of the spectrum we have practitioners who sometimes are classified rather kindly as empty vessels that need to be filled with that expertise. And the knowledge transfer model essentially says, how do we get the expertise from here to there? If you view the problem in that way, then the nature of the evidence that you're trying to transfer is generally it's seen as a product. It's concrete. It has a beginning and an end. The decision-making process that you're trying to influence with evidence is a one-off process. And the solutions then become the ones that are very familiar to us, either push or pull solutions. Push solutions would be things like guidelines or um, glossy summaries, for example. Um, pull solutions would be things like educating uh, managers. Now, it's become quite fashionable to uh, criticise this particular model, but actually it's a model that works in some areas, particularly if you have a fairly high level of certainty about what the knowledge is that you're trying to transfer and a fairly high level of agreement amongst the practitioners that it's the right thing to do. The problem, of course, is in many fields in healthcare, and particularly as far as health service research is concerned, um, that isn't the case. There's a very high degree of uncertainty. And here the second model comes in which is helpful, which is one of knowledge production. It essentially says the problem is not about transferring knowledge, but how and what we produce. Here, the nature of the evidence that we're trying to transfer is not a product, but a process. The nature of the decision-making process is not a one-off event, but an iterative social process. And the solutions then are very different. The solutions are all co-creational ones, or participative ones, the kind of ones that our model uh, fits into. The second body of knowledge that I refer to is around participatory research or community participative inquiry. It's a, uh, an approach to research, a field of research, which is very popular in, in some sectors, in some areas of life, not so much in healthcare. It's more popular in some countries than in others, particularly in North America, where some of the major funders have been funding this kind of work for 10 or 15 years. It hasn't really caught on in, in the UK for reasons that it would be interesting to discuss. But you'll see in this slide a whole range of different um, features of participatory research, which I think are useful ones and ones which underpin the researcher in residence model. The issue here is that um, participatory research can be quite a challenge to more traditional researchers. And Cornwell described this challenge rather nicely when they said um, uh, nearly 20 years ago, the training of some researchers makes it hard for them to relinquish control and embrace community diagnosis and local knowledge. They're taught to consider themselves and the knowledge they have learnt as superior. Training instills in researchers notions of objectivity and of purity of science, which numbs them to the political realities of life in the real world. Really interesting description, numbs them to the political reality. The fourth um, principle that I want to discuss is that, it, is that uh, the model is underpinned by a distinct epistemology. We're often very familiar with philosophies of science and often polarise them. So at one end we have a positive approach, the traditional um, scientific approach that perhaps people like me as a doctor were brought up to. At the other end of the uh, spectrum we have the social science approaches, the uh, constructivism for example or interpretivism. But underpinning uh, the research in residence model, 
is a different kind of philosophy, one that I think is much less talked about than either, either positivism or constructivism. And that's the um, epistemology of pragmatism. Pragmatism was developed by Charles Saunders Peirce and colleagues in the United States in the 1870s. Uh, the term pragmatism is a Greek word uh, referring to action or, or to do. And the implications of this are that rather than describing knowledge as either right or wrong, it's better to describe it as either being more or less useful. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting and rather useful epistemology to underpin what we're trying to achieve here. And the final principle underpinning the model is that it aligns to a range of different theoretical frameworks. And there's lots of good theories about how to get evidence into practice, um, how to make greater use and create more useful evidence. Um, some of those uh, models are relatively linear, some of them more cyclical, some of them more dynamic. And the dynamic models, like the Parrish model, which was uh, developed by Alison Kitson and Joe Rycroft Malone, um, is a really good example of how it's the interaction between the evidence itself, the context within that evidence is being used, and the facilitation function, which makes the difference. Very relevant, I, I think, to our model. The other model which is relevant, which is one which I think is used probably more in uh, North America than it is in uh, Europe, is the dynamic knowledge transfer capacity model, a model which again is very dynamic, very iterative, recognises the interchangeability between different forms of evidence and discusses how organisations have different capacities to absorb and utilise knowledge, absorptive, disseminative and generative uh, 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 capacities. I won't go into these in detail, but if you're interested, there's a lot of really good uh, references to these um, uh, knowledge mobilization models. And I want to talk very quickly through a small number of examples of um, in residence uh, models that we're using, some of which uh, Christina and Beth will be talking about uh, in, a, in a few minutes. First of all, the first model that I ever came across was an anthropologist in residence. First of all, a, a big teaching hospital in Birmingham and then at uh, UCLH. This was Paul Bate, um, um, a very well uh, respected anthropologist, sadly now uh, retired, who did some stunning work as a member of the senior executive team in both of these organisations that happened to have the same uh, chief executive, Sir Robert uh, Naylor. So Sir Robert said, we've got a problem in our organisation. We've got many challenges that we need to address and our leading clinicians are often very detached from those challenges. They get on doing their own stuff. They don't seem to have any sense of corporate or organisational responsibility. What can we do about that? So Paul had had a lot of interest um, in the field of clinical leadership and clinical engagement over the years. He was aware of the theoretical and empirical evidence based in this field. He was aware of a range of different models that are available in different countries. And he brought that expertise to bear within the executive team in these two hospitals and helped them to develop a new model of uh, clinical leadership, which 10 years later is still embedded in that hospital and is copied by many other uh, hospitals around the UK and around the world. UCLH is clearly an organisation that gives a strong emphasis to research because they've now replicating that model in partnership with the North Thames Clark. They've uh, recently appointed a new anthropologist and an organisational researcher um, to work um, uh, within uh, the organisation. So some really interesting stuff going on in the acute sector. In Great Ormond Street, this is the uh, project that Christina is going to be uh, talking about and that I referred to uh, earlier. Um, in Great Ormond Street, uh, they've been doing some very interesting partnership work with, uh, with modelers, with organisational researchers, and I'll leave uh, Christina to describe that to you in more detail. There's a lot of work going on, not just in the acute sector, but also in the uh, community and primary care sectors as well. So I'm working with a researcher, Laura Rare, who's doing some really stunning work. Laura is a social scientist who happens to be a critical discourse analyst. Now, um, those who aren't familiar with that term, it sounds rather grand. Her interest is um, in language and how language is in used and how people uh, communicate. She's working as part of a, a very large-scale integrated care programme, one of the national pioneer uh, programmes um, in East London, and Beth will be talking about this in a second. And um, if ever a, a, a body of academic expertise um, were required in the field of integrated care, then it's definitely around the use of uh, language. So Beth will describe this in a second. The second project, which we haven't got off the ground uh, yet, but we'll be doing so in the new year, is putting an organisational psychologist into uh, general practice in the borough of Newham in East London. Newham's a really exciting, very vibrant um, uh, community with quite a traditional model of uh, general practice, it must be said. Lots of small, um, relatively isolated, often single-handed practices. They recognise that there's a real challenge about how they network together, how they form clusters and federations, 
and this researcher is going to be working with them to help them to optimize those models. And the final example that I want to give um, is uh, a model in which we put a generic health service researcher into an integrated care organization, Whittington Health in North London, to help them to uh, uh, develop a whole range of uh, different um, improvement programs. This slide, which is rather complex, you don't need to look at the detail, essentially compares these um, five different models that I've described for you against a set of criteria. And you'll see that in terms of setting, type of expertise, seniority, um, the duration of the, um, of the uh, uh, research and residence uh, period working, the, their position in the organization, their funding source, and the types of projects are all quite different. So while there's a commonality across this model, the common features that I described in my um, uh, earlier in the presentation, there's also some differences and some flexibility in the model as well. What are our early learning, our early um, reflections, if you like? Well, um, it is early days, but there are some issues that are standing up right now. First of all, the model does seem very attractive. People working in the service to um, uh, funders, to uh, decision makers, whether they be manager, managerial or clinical um, in, background, in, in background. And I guess that's because there are some really big challenges and they just want any help they can get to help them to address them. Some academics also like the idea, and, and maybe I'm being slightly simplistic in this, but I think it's probably fair to say ones at an early stage of their career or ones at a later stage of their career seem to like it more. But I think it's also fair to say that some academics have some significant um, problems, significant concerns with the model, um, both um, practically and philosophically uh, with it. There are risks that we're discovering that the researcher can become isolated, both isolated from their own peers and also from their own um, primary uh, discipline. Um, we're increasingly recognising what the skill set of these researchers and residents are. And I think it's fair to say that not all researchers will have this skill set and not all researchers either will want to or indeed um, should become in residence researchers. So they've got to have credibility amongst their peers. They've got to have the emotional intelligence skills, the ability to listen, to reflect, to communicate, to negotiate um, and to influence. And there's something about the um, resilience of these people which is really important as well. We know the current service environment, with all the stresses that are in it at the moment, makes it um, a very fertile environment to work in, but also a very difficult one. We know that it takes a good period of time to develop trusting relationships, and Christina will be talking about that in her um, presentation. And sometimes a suspicion of what this funny person is that's come into the team. We know that some conversations that research and residents want to have, particularly about some of the um, less savoury things that they might be seeing in their roles, are quite difficult conversations to, to be had. Easy ones if you're detached from the organisation, but if you're part of the team, sometimes it's quite difficult to have those conversations. We realise it's... Um, there's lots of other stakeholders other than the academics and uh, decision makers that uh, need to be involved in this model. And I think it's fair to say that the role of patient service users is one which is very undeveloped in the model at the moment. And finally, there are some ethical considerations um, that we also need to be working through. So finally, we published this model in a paper back in the summer in BMJ uh, Quality and Safety. And I'd urge you to go and have a read of that if you're interested in finding out more. In this paper, we raise a whole series of um, really quite big questions that need to be addressed. And I won't work through all of these, all of these questions because uh, Christina and Beth will be addressing some of them. And I'm sure Bill and your questions will come back to them as well. Um, but I think there are a lot of unanswered questions relating to this model. And one of the things that we want to be doing in the early part of next year is to develop a large scale uh, national evaluation of the model so that we can start answering these questions. Bill, over to you. Martin, thank you so much. That was a stunning introduction to this complex topic. Uh, and it's clearly um, in, in, in curiously engaging with you too. We've had uh, a forest of questions, if you can have a forest of questions, a flurry of questions coming in, which we'll come back to in a second. But now let's go to um, Christina, who, as Martin's already suggested, is embedded uh, at Great Ormond Street. And Christina, welcome. Tell us a little bit about your context and tell us how it is for you. Uh, hello everyone. So I think, um, unlike I think a lot of the other embedded researchers today, I'm actually a mathematician by training. I have no social research training at all. Um, so I'm an ex well, am I an expert? I do operational research as my job, which is a very applied form of maths. I've had a long-standing relationship with Great Ormond Street already doing lots of research projects. And as Martin said, I did a, a pilot research and residence um, 
project with them a few years ago where we really thought what we want to do is build something that's not just useful but is actually used. That was our primary output. And it worked really well. They're still using the software that we built two years later every day. And kind of out of that grew this idea that it would be good to be embedded. And since November last year, I've been 50% of my time at Great Ormond Street. Actually, I'm there two days a week. Um, and I certainly, in the last year, I feel like I've learned so much about it. And so I'm going to kind of start by addressing the first question Martin raised, which is why have these participative approaches to research failed to take off? And I think the things for me is, I went into it thinking, well, I work with Great Ormond Street for ages, I know these people, it will just happen. But it doesn't just happen. It's actually very different to be somewhere physically in that all the other times I've been there, I've been there for a meeting, people had already set time aside to meet with me, I knew why I was there, they knew why I was there. And now I was in a team that actually weren't the team that asked for me. They didn't really know why I was there or what I could do. And I had to, you know, it was about negotiating, about renegotiating my role. Why am I here? What can I offer? What can I learn? And I think it's fair to say as a mathematician, those aren't core bits of your training. Um, and I felt, and actually looking back, I was quite naive and I didn't really know how to integrate into an environment outside of my role as an academic. And you, and you learn, but I think that can actually be a barrier. Um, I wish in retrospect that I'd had some social research training, even a couple of weeks of just anthropology or ethnography or something, just to give me a bit of tips um, when I went in. I think research takes time. Um, I think, you know, the instinct is to go in and try and do something straight away. And actually, it, it does take quite a long time to do something worthwhile. And you have to manage expectations. You have to manage that, that part of your role. And that's where I think, I think I'm the only part-time person on Martin's slide. And that's been, in retro, you know, with hindsight, a great boom. Because it takes time to build relationships. You can't rush it. I don't think me being 100% would have um, sped it up, especially because clinicians are really busy. They don't have that time to devote to you and your projects. So actually, by the time you arrange meetings, and it, you know, months can go by. So having a part-time model over a much longer period of time fits in better with funding cycles, with their work cycles. It leaves me time to do my core academic research as well and keep up your publication rate, which isn't necessarily a nice thing to think about, but that is fundamentally how you're judged as an academic. Um, I think you need to have a lot of patience, and I think the progress feels different, it looks different, it is different, and so if people are expecting your outcomes to be as you get from a grant project, that's not what you're going to get. I mean, how, you, know, you have to value the relationships, you have to value the short bits of advice, the, you know, the quick wins, the changing an ethos, and I don't know if we're prepared as, a, as an academic community to put value on that yet. Um, but just to be a bit more positive, what I think the real benefits have been, just quickly, is thinking about this webinar, I thought, well, how did I normally, how did I get to my academic projects before? And you're waiting almost for a clinician to come to you with, a, with something they want you to work on. Or you have a particular technique that you think might work and you go to hospital and say, do you have something I could do this on? And actually, that means you only really have access to the high, you know, the, the consultants, the research active consultants. And being embedded is, means I get access to the nurses, the data managers, the admin staff, um, the, the unit managers, and I really get to talk to them and say, well, what is your job and what are the problems that you have? And you find out about things that are so pervasive, people wouldn't ever consider it research or they wouldn't ever consider it even a problem anymore. And you say, well, actually, maybe I could help with that. You can kind of cut across hierarchies, you can cut across um, different kind of silos within the hospital. If you've built your relationship, people do see you as objective and they do see that you don't have a um, a clinical agenda. I, I have nothing to gain. I'm not a doctor. I have no training as a doctor. So I think that is, is a massive benefit. And the consultants themselves have said to me they really value having someone just there. They can talk to you much earlier in the research process. It, you know, there doesn't have to be, you don't have to kind of make the effort to go out to university, make contact, have a project. And I think that is a, it's, yeah, it's been a massive difference. Christine, thanks very much. And uh, just one question before we move to Beth, you've described this massive hospital <laughs> as your residence. Um, I'm curious, uh, wh which part of the residence do you go and either um, put your laptop or call your own or hang your, hang your coat? Where, how does that work at a very practical level? Um, so I'm within the whole of critical care, which is three intensive care units. It has um, another bit called the Children's Acute Transport Service, CATS, 
which is, uh, serves the whole of the North Thames area and basically transports really sick children into mm. tertiary centres. And then there's also the kind of administrative offices in a different building. And to begin with, I had keys to, I think, three or four offices over that hospital, mm. as well as two different offices at UCL, which was a bit of a... It was very difficult to manage. And, and actually what happened is that I ended up spending my whole time on Great Ormond Street in Cats in the Children's Acute Transport Service. And we decided that I'd start there simply because they had a lot of data and they hadn't really ever had any research support. But, um, and then I was kind of, I have a room there, like I call it a quiet room. And that's been great, except I realized that actually I was still physically separated from most of the team. So I could hear them talking and for me to go and join in, I'd actually have to come out and say, hey, I've been listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have something okay. to say, whereas it's actually been much more useful the days I've been hot desking in the main room, and then you can just much more organically join into a conversation. Great. But I've had to kind of learn those skills mm. on the, well, I hope I've learned them. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and this is an ongoing conversation. Again, if you have detailed questions to Christina about how it works in practice, we'd love to have them. And Christina, I know, is happy to answer those out of this session. Um, Beth, you're coming at this from a slightly different perspective. You're, uh, you have a managerial hat on here. And you're faced with all sorts of different decisions uh, about what, where value for money is and what's the right thing to do. How did you come into this? And tell us your story, please. So the programme that I'm involved with um, is one of the 14 National Integrated Care Pioneers. Martin's quite familiar with it. It's an immensely complicated programme. It started in uh, 2012 with a <coughs> building of a case for change. Um, the... I think we were always mindful that we would need evaluation as one of our key enabling work streams, <clears throat> along with things like uh, informatics and how we contract for integrated care and how we um, reimburse people for providing integrated services. Um, so across the three clinical commissioning groups who are pa uh, uh, partners in this programme uh, in Newham and in Waltham Forest and in Tower Hamlets, um, we identified to them that in investing the kinds of sums of money that they were going to in uh, investing in the, the, the service model <coughs> and some of the other enablers, we really needed to be able to evaluate across the program to A, help people to get the best value for money, but also to make sure that we learned from the things over a five-year program that didn't work. So to make sure that we were continually learning from doing and bringing in the learning from across the pioneers but and more widely the, inter, the, the international evidence base around integrated care. Uh, so I think we made the case for investment in the researcher and residence model particularly because I think it, um, it more than anything else people uh, liked the idea of having somebody as part of the team embedded in part of the team rather than somebody who was doing the evaluation to them. Uh, so uh, th that, uh, that business case was agreed about this time last year and Laura started in September of this year. So, she, so she's been around uh, just for a, f for a few months and we're at the very early stages and some of those lessons that Christine's just been talking about actually have been you know, quite valuable for me hearing now um, because my role really now with, with our at Researcher and Residence Law is to try and figure out how best to embed her in the programme. I think one of the things that I'm reflecting on is actually that my whole team are struggling even after 18 months in how to embed themselves in supporting and facilitating the, the pragmatic, the doing end of this programme and just like the lessons that we've learned in doing that, I think there's, there's some learning for Laura as well. Great. Um, what made you, in the first instance, think that having a embedded, a, an embedded researcher would be good use of public money, uh, albeit you have a very large project, I think. What, what made you believe that might be the case? So, I, so two, two things, really. Um, one, one is the, the, the proportionally the investment in having a researcher in residence is a very small fraction of what the clinical commissioning groups are investing in their service models and their informatics enabler and all the other bits that go alongside integrated care. Um, so, that, so that's one thing, is making sure that we are learning from the programme as we are doing it and making sure that we are getting value from money from these services, what works in one borough, 
may not work in another? Why doesn't it work? What are the things that, that explain that? Uh, but I think the other part of it is uh, being able to have somebody as part of the team as opposed to being done to. I think we're very used to, uh, particularly with the clinical commissioning groups and uh, my experience with primary care trusts, their predecessors, was that we're very used to putting a bid out there for someone to do evaluation, whether it's an academic institute or whether it's a commercial ma um, management consultant. And, um, and we would, you know, we're quite used to being evaluated. Uh, as we get evaluation exhaustion, but having somebody embedded within the team means yeah. we can just deal with it in a very different way. So something very appropriate for having a researcher interested in discourse, that you want the active, not the passive. Here. Well, that's the big thing about this yeah. programme, is that actually it is all about the relationships uh, and, and the communication across and between the, the complexity of stakeholders. Yeah. So the discourse analysis actually lends itself to the kind of relationships that people are building in order to join their services up. Do you, do you have to translate <coughs> discourse analysis to sceptical clinicians? We're all learning. We're all learning about what discourse analysis is together, um, and Laura's helping us through that. But I think the really great thing is that because we are integrating across health and social care, having somebody from a social science mm. research background is incredibly valuable in starting to translate some of those, uh, you know, the language mm. across some of those barriers as well. Great. Martin, uh, a response and then lots of questions to pose to you all. Martin. Yeah, I think that there's another, just adding to what Beth said, there's another reason that um, a research and residence is a good model for the field of integrated care, and that's the academic reason. There's a, there's a massive body of literature out there um, to guide the process of integrated care. Uh, and without being too rude to people, I think integrated care is one of those areas that doesn't tend to be very cognizant of that evidence base. So it's really helpful to have an experienced researcher who can who can translate it and summarise it for, for managers and clinicians. Wonderful. That, that wasn't rude at all. That was the uh, objective. Um, so here's the first of a number of questions. Thank you if you've sent this one in. Um, how do you deal with the demand for real-time results from the service that you are embedded in. Um, Christina, let me start with you, because I guess there's a bit of pressure. You were talking about your eavesdropping moments and your feeling that you needed to be out there. Do people keep asking you for, for answers? I think the first thing I did when I got there, I sat down with one of the main consultants and I kind of said, well, what kind of issues do you have? What would you like to see? And he kind of taught me through some ideas, some of which I could see were quite long term. And there was one thing about having a summary of recent activity. So I thought, oh, I can do that. I can do that really quickly. I'll show them I'm really useful. So I just went away and I just did it. And it took about a month. And then it came to the new year and I was like, ta-da. And it kind of turned out actually no one really wanted it. <laughs> and, and, and then I thought, oh, OK. Um, and then I thought again about it. And I ended up doing another project, which took about nine months looking at the, the surge in winter demand for ICU, which is a really relevant topic as it's all in the news now. And, um, and again, like actually as a research project, it took about nine months, me working two days a week. Um, and now it's a tool that they're using every day. And there's a paper, it's under review. That's actually quite quick mm -hmm. in research terms. But I think for them, it did feel like a long time. And so now when I'm looking at new projects, I am taking a lot longer, <laughs> talking to a lot more people. And it is about saying, okay, well, these are the things I can do. These are things that maybe we could apply for together for grants. Mm -hmm. And some of it is signposting different skills. I think one of the great things about being embedded is you learn a bit of humility in that you get to see all those problems which no one would ever come to you with. And you actually, there's loads of stuff that I'm useless for. And that's a really good lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to appreciate the things you can do, but also the things you can't do. Martin, you're, you're smiling and nodding. <laughs> I, I am, I am. The, um, a, a, a Harvard academic called Julio Frank uh, described this difference in the use of time uh, really nicely. He said that um, decision makers are chronophobic and researchers are chronophilic. <laughs> so, so decision makers uh, are fearful of time. They want to make very quick decisions. Uh, researchers are the exact opposite. Their decisions yeah. are better when they allocate time. And this is part of the compromise, yeah. actually, because both solutions yeah. need to be worked through. So that, yeah. that, that's where the model works. Uh, and uh, you're holding the tension, you're holding the ring here. Uh, how does it look from your perspective? Well, uh, uh, within, again, within the, the Pioneer programme, we um, uh, 
the, the, I think this, this may make life a little bit easier for our res researcher and residents because we already have some governance around this. So we have a steering group that are set up for evaluation and we, we have um, <coughs> um, a, a board that are set up to receive some of these results. I think they are all champing at the bit to start getting some of that feedback. So there will be some tension around that. But actually, there are some natural places where we can start to feed some of the <coughs> some of the findings, some of the observations okay. back into the system, and in that sense, the, there's a um, <coughs> there's a there's a, a, a sort of cushion around our researcher and residents that perhaps you didn't have when you when you started. That doesn't mean that the, I think the tensions will be different because they'll be looking for mm. for those real time results a lo mm. lot faster. Mm. So I'm I'm hearing that as well as that very helpful framework slide you showed us, Martin quite a lot of the tips that any of the watchers and listeners might want are about understanding some of the likely questions that they might get posed, whether, whichever side, if there is a side of a fence or a side of a wall of a, wall of a room you're on. Is, is that a reasonable thing to be hearing? Yes, it, it's, it's, yes. I described how one of the fundamental skills is emotional intelligence, the ability yeah. to listen and to reflect. Yeah. Um, so um, this isn't the model where you go into the environment with your preset research questions. Yeah or even necessarily your, your preset frameworks or values, yes. you have to go in and understand where people are coming from in your desire yes. to be useful. So in your uh, earlier presentation, you, you, you made a, uh, it wasn't a throwaway remark, but it, you made an observation that about seniority and seniority mm -hmm. of researchers. And I wondered if you might uh, just develop this a little more. There's a question here about hierarchies, and it goes like this. How do you propose to overcome hierarchical barriers to engaging with the researcher in residence model? And I guess that could be in the clinical setting or in the mm. academic setting. Do you have mm. any thoughts on that one? Yeah, so I, I described how um, some of the uh, researchers in residence have been very senior, people like uh, uh, Paul Bate, uh, for example, um, who said that was the only way he ever wanted to practice research, which is very interesting. Um, others like um, uh, Laura, who's working with us in, in East London, is just immediately postdoc. And we've had one researcher in residence who didn't have a doctorate, who had a, a research master's, very good at research, but a research master's. So there is a full spectrum. Um, one of the criteria for a successful research in residence is credibility. And I suspect it's probably easier to have that credibility when you're more senior but sometimes the more junior people do bring something that's quite unique um, in terms of, uh, I guess, in particular, um, they're more accessible, perhaps, than a senior academic might be. The most important I think, thing, I think, is if you have a junior researcher, they do have to be very emotionally intelligent. That's got nothing to do with age, mm -hmm. but they do have to be very emotionally intelligent. Mm -hmm. And they do have to have some ground cover. They have to have some support from senior uh, okay. colleagues. And that's something that Beth and I are doing a lot with Laura. And, and, yeah. and I know that um, there's, a, there's an emerging network that has senior uh, support as well. Do, do you see this from your perspective, Christina? Does it, is it even register on your radar or, or not? Uh, yes. <laughs> as a you know, research mathematician, I think you have a very different training to people who've trained in social research. I have no training in how organisations work, how conversations work, negotiation. And I think if I had tried to do this at the beginning of my career, or even five years ago, it would have been so much harder. And I think a lot of, when it comes to credibility, my credibility comes from, I guess, the, the technical expertise and people tend to have a respect for maths, whether that's justified or not. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's actually a barrier. Um, but I think, you know, I've learned through my projects and my work to, um, to respect every role in the health, you know, in health services, right, you know, all the way through and I think that shows and it's your attitude really matters people have to know that, that you value their expertise and that you need their expertise and you have to understand that you don't have all the answers and I think and I think if you go in and say to people well that's wrong or that's it just it will never work okay a um, couple of questions here about the role of researcher in residence um, one is essentially asking um, is it appropriate for the researcher in residence to come with his or her own predetermined question and the second is uh, a more comparative, uh, reflective remark. What do you see as the relative merits of researcher and residence model as compared with the work that clinical academics do who are nested in and often in positions of leadership with respect to clinical teams? Um, Martin, could I start with you mm. on both those? Mm. So as far as clinical academics are, are, are concerned, um, I think we're probably talking about a different model because there aren't many 
um, health service research clinical academics. There are plenty of clinical, um, clinically orientated clinical academics. And in, in this field, we're talking about health service research. Um, so um, I, do, I do have a lot of um, senior um, clinical academic colleagues who, um, who have world leading reputations in their field and they're becoming increasingly um, frustrated that they're not having the impact they want to have and are very interested in this model. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily make them good um, researchers uh, in residence. So, um, so I think, I think um, that, that's slightly different. Sorry, your first question was? First question was about whether or not it's appropriate for a researcher in residence to be presenting with a yeah. question that's in a sense the question that they have. It's about the ownership yeah. of the research issue. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a problem. So I think as a researcher in residence, you should absolutely be confident in your body of expertise, your, your, your specific specialty as an academic. But to go in with preordained questions, to me, runs counter to the model, which is about being responsive to yeah. service needs. And that's yeah. why you need a long conversation at the beginning and go through a process at the beginning that uh, Christina described yeah. really beautifully of, of negotiation, of yeah. understanding, and of compromise around yeah. what the research question is you can add most value to. Yeah. Beth, you're nodding. I, you, you, are you agreeing with that well, I was I was just imagining um, if our researcher in residence had come to our evaluation <laughs> yeah. steering group with a yeah. predetermined question, I yes. think that would have been that might have been the end of yeah, the model well. entirely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think it's really important that actually because because the because the evaluation and the research is embedded in the program that the people involved in the program own that question. Okay, and I think we got that very strongly <coughs> from your your uh, presentation, Christine. I guess I mean for me, why do you want to be a researcher in residence? I mean, it's, to me, it's about making an impact and, and helping people on the problems they really care about. So how could I possibly do it if I came in okay. with my well, own great, question? Great question <laughs> and <laughs> unanimously clear answer. Um, I'm not sure whether you'll have such a unanimous uh, answer to this question. Uh, how long does a researcher have to be in residence, however you define that, for them to be a researcher in residence? Who'd like to take that one? I'm sure that's one I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> early days, early days. And Martin, well, is there any... There's two components, aren't there? <laughs> how, how long in, in terms of duration and, Indeed. and how frequently. Yep. Um, so Christina's model, five years, half time, essentially, is, is a really interesting model. Yep. And what think, other models have you seen? Well, we've, we, our models are mostly um, shorter periods of time, um, two years, I think is a minimum, mm -hmm. two to three years, um, but usually full time uh, for that period of time. Um, so I think there's a range of different models, but, but recognising that time is an important component of building relationships, yeah. I, think, I, think that is, I think it has to be um, over a fairly long period of time. The challenge yeah. then is funding, and perhaps we'll come back yeah. to funding questions I think we uh, will. later. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Beth? Well, I was just going to say, so I think if the question is actually how long do they have to be in residence to be effective, mm -hmm. then um, I th th the answer is almost certainly going to be at least 18 months, two years, and that's the, that is going to be the interesting challenge for, for us in terms of funding, is that we'll just be getting to the point where our researcher and residence is really starting, I think, probably, to turn around some results okay. at the point when the funding runs out. So this <laughs> clutch of questions are going to build on absolutely those. Won't, won't, there are a clutch of questions about how do you get this kind of approach funded? And then there's a related uh, set of questions about how do you know whether it's working? How, how do you evaluate? You talked about uh, doing a larger scale study of it, Martin. How do you mm. know um, mm. generically or specifically about the kind of uh, outcomes yeah. you would expect to see and how quickly and how would you yeah. go about that? So yeah. uh, in, in either order, how do you get it funded and how do you know whether it's working? They may be related. Yeah. Um, Martin, let me start with you. So fund, funding, first of all, a uh, very real issue in the, in the current uh, environment. Um, there are a number of potential sources of funding that the service themselves, perhaps commissioners or, or providers, might want to employ their own um, researchers in, in residence. Um, uh, maybe mainstream funders, mainstream research funders might be interested in it. I mean, it has to be said there isn't a, a strong track record of mainstream funders wanting to fund participative research, but maybe they'd be interested. Or there's charitable uh, funding as well. Um, our belief, um, quite strongly actually, is that if the service, if the people who are trying to be helped by this model aren't willing to pay for it, then it won't work. Mm -hmm. So they need to have some skin in the game. So whilst the implications of that are less funding and shorter term funding often, particularly in the current environment in the health service, we think that that funding is important. Now, Christina's model was slightly different and perhaps she could describe yeah, that, but, but, but I, I, I think by and large ownership is, is, is important. 
I'd like to say that the people that we're working with, the funders that we're working with, have made a strategic investment in this model, but that would be um, slightly optimistic to say that. Uh, the people who are funding this model um, from the service are mostly people who've had um, an end of year underspend and have looked around to use it, and we've been there uh, with an offer. Um, to them. Okay. So we've been very pragmatic uh, okay. about this. I'd like to hope that, that um, organisations will do really what Beth was describing earlier and make a strategic investment. Say actually in order to be more effective as an organisation this is a model that could help us. So I think... Yeah. So have a yeah. relationship uh, ready, have a, uh, a compelling project ready and watch for the end of year. Exactly. Very exa good. Exactly. Very good. And, and encourage them to be more strategic. And encourage them to be more strategic. <laughs> yeah. Good. Christina, who's funding you? Can you just talk about your funding model? So I'm actually funded on a five-year infrastructure grant from the Great Ormond Street charity, mm -hmm. which although obviously it's um, closely linked to Great Ormond Street, is a completely independent entity. Mm -hmm. And that was um, the lead research uh, consultant within paediatric intensive care put forward this bid. Half of it was for a new intensive care system to collect loads of new data. And half of it was for me. Um, with the intention of using that data, they haven't installed the system yet. Um, and part of it was just to build research capacity. So it was quite a broad brief. There wasn't a specific project. It was how to support research across the different units, across the different types of research questions. Mm. Um, and I think that has to be long term. If you think like now I'm starting to apply for grants with various people in the units, you know, there's a year, 18 months, then you want to show that that's worth it and it's, and it's snowballed. And you're slowly changing the kind of questions people talk about at Great Ormond Street, I found. The critical care was very clinically focused, let's try this drug, you know, very interventionist, which is really important, but there's all this other organisational research that they could be doing, um, and information research, which I guess is more my area. Yeah. So it's, it's building that, and that has to take a long time. And I don't know, and I'm hoping it would get funded after five years, yeah. and then I imagine it would probably have to come from the organisation okay. if I've demonstrated value. Beth, how, how, how what proportion uh, of this overall project is the funding for this researcher approach and, and how did you go about uh, liberating that money? Yeah, it's, it's less than 1%. And as Martin, so Martin said, 1% we, we, um, of the investment in the service model, I should say. Um, we, we made the case about this time last year um, to the organisations who are commissioning those services. Um, so whilst what Martin describes about end of year funding and non-recurrent monies is true, that is probably where the money came from, there was a strategic decision before that money was liberated at the end of the year. Um, and I think we had a lot of debate about whether we should be, I think the ownership thing is really important that the, the, um, uh, what, what Martin's described in terms of those organisations having invested, but I can see a point where um, we will need to use the kind of early findings to look at more traditional routes of funding. So there were lots of debates about do we pump prime this for two years mm -hmm. and mindful that actually it's, it's a five-year programme and we're going to need to find the remaining three yeah. years plus plus. Does that make sense to you, Martin, that yeah, there, yeah, might, there needs to be some sort of interim assessment of progress and then a more robust evaluation? Yes, I think, I think it, well, certainly in terms of funding, I'd like to think that at some stage in the near future, mainstream funders would be yeah. interested in funding participative research. Yeah. I described in my presentation how in the United States that happens already and has done for 15 mm. years or more. Um, seems to be much more reluctance um, in the UK. Possibly, I guess, uh, ESRC might be willing to do so, mm. but not, not most of the conventional health uh, funders. Mm. In terms of evaluation, um, really good question, and I hope that there'll be some answers from uh, people, mm. not just not just questions in relation to this. We do need yeah. to evaluate this model, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it would be odd to evaluate it using the methods that we're not proposing. Mm. I, you'd expect a participative evaluation yeah. of it, uh, I suppose. At the moment, what we're trying to do is encourage the in-residence researchers to, um, to keep reflective diaries. That's yeah. some data that helps us to understand how the model uh, is developing. Um, we're... We, we have uh, one small-scale evaluation that was done by Cathy Pope from Southampton of uh, the Great Ormond Street uh, um, uh, project, mm -hmm. uh, and that was really, really helpful. We've set, we, well, at least for the projects that I'm working with uh, in Welk, we're setting objectives for the, for the researcher, and we will 
assess their um, contribution alongside yeah. their achievement of those objectives. And then finally, there has to be some kind of large scale evaluation. And that's the work that we're working on with a range of colleagues across the UK now on, on developing. And I can imagine, I can imagine a series of literature reviews, I can imagine some uh, national surveys scoping mm -hmm. um, different elements of the model from across the country, because I'm sure there's models out there that aren't called in residence models mm -hmm. that satisfy our criteria. Mm -hmm. um, and then probably some in-depth case studies um, would, would be useful. Those are the kind of methodologies mm -hmm. that we're thinking about evaluating them, but it's early days. Great, it's early days, and as Martin says, uh, early days means if you have ideas or you'd like to be part of this, please uh, get in contact uh, with Martin. Um, we've got about five minutes left, and this is just a gentle reminder to my colleagues here that we want uh, them to liberate any practical tips that they're beginning to uh, be prepared to offer the different actors in this emerging drama, those in the service, those in academia, and those in this middle space that uh, Martin was talking about. But it's that middle space I just want to spend a moment on, a very thoughtful question from someone who feels that what Martin is describing is absolutely uh, what this person's doing. It, it goes like this. Hi all, I'm finding this all extremely relevant. This is the model I've been informally fulfilling and trying to develop within my particular organisation. My post was externally funded and turned down for core funding, even though I was reassured the role enhanced the service greatly and the two-year fixed-term contract was renewed for 12 years. I've now taken up a PhD fellowship and would hope to return to a similar role with enhanced skills. And it's a, a longer version of a, another shorter question which says, how on earth do you get into this emerging research field? What, is there any training for it? Where would you go? And I just wonder whether I could uh, turn to uh, each of you. Uh, and do you have any advice to offer? That that's a cri de coeur from a young researcher, you know, faced with all these different choices. Mm. How can we support them better get into this field? M Martin, I'm sure you've given this some thought. Yeah, so it's, it's remarkable the number of people who, when I describe this model to them, say, ah, I'm one of those, and I didn't, I didn't realise it, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is really interesting. I, I, I think there is a desire amongst some researchers, not all researchers, and as I say, we don't want all researchers to do this, desire amongst some researchers uh, to do this. I don't have any magic answers to how they um, then go about creating the roles. I think if they, there are certain organisations that are more aligned to this kind of philosophy, and I think the, some of the clerks uh, are doing it, uh, and some of the academic health science networks are doing it. So it's worthwhile having conversations with academics working in those mm -hmm. two organisations to see if there's any yeah. uh, local models yeah. that they could um, engage with. Otherwise, it's a question of finding a really applied, participative type researcher and saying, you know, can you help me with my career? Can you give me, can you give me some advice? I think it'd be very helpful to set up some kind of uh, national network. We have a local network of, of, of emerging researchers in residence, some kind of national yes. network that will help people to learn together would be useful. Yes. Um, and, uh, and I think established organisations like the Health Service Research Network have an important role to play um, in this territory. What I don't think we should underestimate is the extent to which um, this model and the philosophy underpinning it is quite countercultural. Mm. Not, not in all parts of the country, but it's quite countercultural. So it does require a, a fairly mm. concerted um, strategic approach to start embedding it. Okay. Christina, your advice on this? I suppose for me, I don't actually do improvement science. I do the improvement bit. And so it's just grown out of research more and more about how do you actually improve what's happening and how can you help clinical teams make their decisions, how can you help them use their information. And fundamentally, you know, you have to care enough that for me, I'd rather do something that I felt had a positive impact than worry about the publication. And I'd rather not have to make that choice, but actually you kind of do. And that's where I think also being a bit higher up in your career helps, because if you have enough publications, you can take the hit. Whereas at the beginning, there's a lot of pressure on young academics to kind of publish, publish, publish. Could, could clinical researchers be doing this in parallel to a mathematical researcher? Is there any reason why that crossover couldn't be happening? Well, again, it's, it's, it's about health service research. So if there are clinical yeah. researchers interested in yeah. organisation and delivery yeah. of health services, not clinical subjects, yeah. then, yeah, no reason why they can't at all. OK. Um, I'm going to invite each of you um, to imagine you have just a few moments, seconds, actually, to give your uh, refined wisdom, some tips, some advice, things that you've learned to anyone in this emerging drama. And I'm going to start on my left and then move down the line. No what advice, there. What no pressure, <laughs> what advice would you give from your perspective to anyone starting out, perhaps doing it in a similar sort of way to you? So, so I think the key things for me are that there is a case to be made, um, but, but for the 
person asking that particular question, I would have said find, find a sympathetic manager because actually it does need the kind of making the business case, making the justification for, for money. I am hopeful that the way we have set it up locally with a, with a managerial programme support and academic support um, will sort of create the best of both worlds. So again, I think that's kind of important, okay. having the local manager to steer through. I'm going to have to stop you there right. and just give you five <laughs> seconds each. Okay, I think you need patience and I think having a quantitative and a qualitative researcher working together would be brilliant. Brilliant. Martin. Be resilient. It's, uh, it's tough um, territory. Um, neither academics nor practitioners will necessarily uh, love you. So find groups of peers and mentors to support you through it. Thank you. So uh, that's been a fascinating discussion. And thank you for your input. Thank you for your candid answers. Uh, uh, but most of all, can we all now uh, put our virtual hands together and thank our three very skilled presenters here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Beth. George, thank you Christina Pargel, and thank you Martin Marshall. A full recording of this webinar will shortly be accessible from the Health Foundation's website. Please share it widely with other interested colleagues. Our programme continues next year and we will let you know of future events uh, when we have those dates and topics. Thank you.